coming out today. Uh, and thank you in particular to all the donors that helped make this possible. Uh, we're going to taste some chocolate. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you. Uh, we're going to taste some chocolate today. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, but what I really want to do is walk you through sort of a day in the test kitchen to show you what we do. Um, and let me start off with the actual test kitchen. Uh, it is down in the Seaport District in the Innovation and Design Building. Uh, we have a 15,000 square foot test kitchen. It is huge. It's candy land. There are actually four kitchens plus a photo studio that has a full kitchen in it. Um, we have tons of ovens. The ovens are always being uh, monitored to make sure they're accurate. Tons of stoves. We have um, a dishwasher that washes dishes in a minute and a half and sanitizes them. Oh, it's the best. We also have four people who work in the dish room to make sure all the dishes get done on time and keep all 40 cooks cooking all day long. Uh, the 40 cooks, test cooks, are there Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Um, and uh, we also have a, a vigorous intern program uh, in the kitchen. Uh, we have about between 8 and 12 interns from local culinary schools, or sometimes they travel quite a ways to work with us. And uh, they help us prep. We, uh, we do what's called abuse testing, not on the interns, but for the recipes. We have people uh, cook them in different scenarios on different styles of stove tops with different kinds of equipment to see how the recipes react. Um, and then here we have the new uh, studios. On the, um, on the top, that's the new America's Test Kitchen studio. And those windows actually overlook uh, the dry dock downtown. So these huge ships are coming in out the window and getting gussied up and cleaned up and then leaving. So it's always a changing scenery. And on the bottom, that is the new set of Cook's Country, uh, which we used to years ago film in a farmhouse in Vermont. We haven't done that in many years. Um, and it, again, it looks very different, but it's across the hall from America's Test Kitchen, which is very convenient. Um, because filming um, is very expensive, and we're PBS. So uh, when we film the TV shows, there's 26 episodes of America's Test Kitchen, and we film that in about three weeks. So we early mornings, you stay there late, because the cameras, the cameramen, the lighting, it's all very expensive, so we try to get it uh, done as quickly as we can, as efficiently as we can. And then for Cook's Country, uh, it's 13 episodes, and we film that in um, eight days across the hall but everything's there the dish rooms there all the cooks are there so it's very it's very easy for us to do the shows and when we're not filming the shows we're filming a host of other things so that's the test kitchen um, and I want to walk through how we do recipe development because I think it's pretty unique I don't know a lot of other uh, magazines that do this or cookbooks um, we produce over a thousand recipes a year on average each recipe takes three to five weeks to develop um, and the first thing we do before we develop a recipe is we survey our readers and viewers. Do any of you get surveys? Thank you. <laughs> Your input is really important because we don't have any advertising. So we have to make sure that our books and our magazines are delivering the content that our readers really want. And the only way to know that is to keep asking. Uh, what's on your radar? What are you having trouble with? What are your new interests? And so we survey recipe ideas. Um, favorite recipe of mine is roast chicken will probably always be roast chicken I could talk about roast chicken for hours I've been pulled off stages still talking about roast chicken before Bridget's turned it Bridget my uh, my co-host has turned it into a drinking game whenever I say roast chicken <laughs> yeah it's a thing so but I'm gonna use roast chicken as a uh, an example of how we develop a recipe so let's say roast chicken rated highly which it does um, and the recipe gets handed to one of our 40 test cooks and that test cook is responsible for shepherding the recipe through the entire process and writing a story at the end. Uh, their first stop is our library, our private cookbook collection um, at America's Test Kitchen. It's fairly large, it's about 5,000 books at this point. Uh, we have it professionally organized by library and science and technology students. And um, they, have to, they, they had to come up with a new system for categorizing just cookbooks because it's such uh, a, f a fine selection of book types that we needed uh, more organization. Uh, and the first stop is there. And if you're doing roast chicken, what they would do um, is they would pull up every recipe for roast chicken they could find. And uh, we, they, we use something called Eat Your Books. 
Anyone know Eat Your Books? It's not a high fiber diet. Sounds like it. It is a website, and I think for a nominal fee, you can go on and you enter all the cookbooks that you own. And what it does is it provides you with a complete table of contents for all of your cookbooks. So you can type in a recipe for roast chicken, and it'll tell you all the books you own that have that recipe. So it helps you use your cookbooks. So we use that tool quite a bit. Uh, it's called Eat Your Books. Um, so we'd pull out all the recipes for roast chicken we could find, we'd spread them on a table, we'd um, look at the difference of ingredients, approach, and the test cook will pick five recipes that span the range of ideas and they'll make them in a side-by-side -side test. And we do this for every recipe. So whether it's turkeys, uh, soups or stews, this is one of my favorites. This is baked Alaska. Right. It's a tricky dessert. I know, look at this one on the end. Like, oh, what a bummer. You know, this is not, you know, this is not an easy recipe. And if you, I'm sure it tasted great, you know, but still, uh, the things you learn in this five recipe is really interesting. Um, and we all t uh, stand around and take notes from um, the, from the tasting perspective, if you go to one of these, you taste them, you mention what you like and what you don't like, and then you talk about what the ideal version of this would be. And then from the cook's perspective, they think about what worked, what didn't work, too many steps, too many pots and pans, this step was skimped, and then they cobble together a working recipe and they test the variables independent of one another. It's like the scientific method. So from after the first five recipe piece, you show up at tastings and it's a lot of this. Um, no labels, A versus B. And you taste it and you tell them which one's better. And um, one, one of my favorite stories about roast chicken again is uh, for the weeknight roast chicken that Brian Roof did years ago on the show. It's one of our all time favorite recipes. Anyone know this one? Yeah. So. When he was developing this recipe, um, we were back in the old kitchen. We moved downtown about four years ago. The old kitchen was in Brookline Village. And he had five chickens in five different ovens at slightly different oven temperatures. He was testing the effect of oven temperature on chicken. And the power went out. So, you know, he left the chickens in the ovens as they were off and cooling down so that, you know, they would cook through and at least he could send them home with people so the food wouldn't be wasted. They were the best chickens he had ever made. And so he added that to his recipe. He had you, the recipe has you turn the oven off after 35 minutes. Because as the chicken finishes cooking more slowly, it hangs on to more of its juices and it's more tender. And which is basically what people I think at home do when you cook something. If you have something you're known for, you make it, you make it over and over, but then one day you're missing an ingredient. Whatever spatula you usually use is dirty, so you use a different implement, it works better or worse. Your brand of canned tomatoes is out, so you use something else. And so you're testing it slowly over time, just by happenstance. And we do the same thing, just in an organized manner. So um, here we have just more tests, that side-by-side -side tests. This is roasting time for bones for stock. This is roux, obviously. Um, the darker the roux, you can see how it goes from um, less liquidy, it's quite solid here, to more liquidy as it gets darker. As roux get darker, they get more flavorful, but their thickening power is much reduced. So, uh, so that's how we develop a recipe. And after we're done with our testing, which again, 30 to 50 tests, um, on average it takes six to $8,000 worth of groceries to go through one test for the whole process. Yeah, and which is why our website isn't free. Because um, <laughs> we have no advertising. But before we publish a recipe, we send it out to readers and viewers. Is anyone um, a recipe tester? Oh, thank you, thank you. If you want to be a recipe tester, um, you can go to our website. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but so we send recipes out with a survey. And we ask people to make the recipes and fill out a survey with questions like, did you make the recipe? And uh, were the instructions easy to understand? Could you have used a photo along the way to help you understand? And one of the questions on the survey is that's the most important is would you make the recipe again? Every recipe has to get an 80% yes, I would make the recipe again before it gets published. If it falls under that, it goes back into the test kitchen with all the reader comments of what didn't translate. Because at the end of the day, we can make anything work in that kitchen. We have shoppers, we have people doing the dishes, we have all clad stacked to the ceiling. I mean, it is Candyland. 
But uh, that's not the value of a recipe, is whether we can make it, it's whether you all can make it in your home kitchens. So, once a recipe passes that final test, it goes into the magazines and goes on TV. Uh, we're also known for our equipment testing. Um, we're unbiased, we accept no freebies. If we, accept, if we get freebies, we either send them back or donate them. Uh, we buy all our own equipment at a variety of different stores uh, and a variety of different lot numbers to make sure that if one lot is bad of skillets, that we're not um, degrading that skillet or grading it down because it was a, a bad manufacturing issue. Um, <laughs> this is blenders. This is one of our more popular testings. She's using a tachometer to see how fast the blades move. Um, and what we found is that um, you think faster blades mean a better blender, but what we found is slower blades are the better blenders. Because all blenders can go fast. But if you have a good blender and it goes more slowly, when the chunks are really big, the slow blenders can make contact with the food rather than splatter it to the sides of the blender jar so where they won't make contact. Uh, so that was one test we figured out. How loud the blenders are um, is an issue, especially if you like making margaritas in the morning. <laughs> um, <laughs> this, I love this test. This is a kale smoothie. And you can see all the, all the brands on the top. And it's just painted on a piece of parchment paper to see how finely we were able to get that kale. Um, so tests like that. Here's a slow cooker testing. Um, and this, uh, these slow cookers are hooked up to this <laughs> really, really fancy new age computer from 1980. Um, <laughs> but they have thermal couples in them. And what we're doing is we're monitoring the heat. And what we found as we did this is most slow cookers have a, a high and a low. And what we found is it should be called fast and slow. Because no matter if you're cooking on high or low, it gets to the same temperature eventually. The difference is how quickly it gets there. And so that had an effect on our, our recipes when we learned what the difference was. Um, we also found that things were burning on the back side of the slow cookers when we were testing them. So we kind of took, took them open here inside. This is a, a gentleman from MIT. And you can see the, um, who came to hang out. You can see the heating elements are on the back side of the slow cooker, which is where things were burning. And that's because the, um, the controls the, uh, were on the front side, all the mechanics. And so you didn't want the burners near the controls where you could short something out. Um, a quick solve for that, if it happens to you, um, take aluminum foil, fold it over a couple times, and place it in the slow cooker in the crock. It's just a physical barrier to prevent things from burning. Um, oh, <laughs> the splatter test. So uh, that's Lisa. She's um, the, in charge of our tastings and testings. And we're testing uh, zipper lock bags. And I know, you can see all of us in the background are just thinking, what are we doing? So we tarped off the kitchen completely. And Lisa figured out a way to fill these bags with identical amounts of tomato sauce and put them on a pizza peel and to identically roll them off the counter to see which one's busted open. They measured the splatter. I mean, it was very Dexter. Um, but it was a good way to tell which ones worked. Um, and so that's our equipment testing. And we also taste test ingredients, which I think is fascinating. Because you, when you identify and you single out an ingredient and you realize how important those ingredients are. I remember my first taste test 20 years ago was black pepper. And I thought I wasn't gonna be able to taste anything or it wouldn't make a big deal. Um, you really can. If you're just eating plain rice with freshly ground cracked pepper of different varieties, you really can taste a difference. And broth, I think, is one of the most interesting. The wrong chicken broth can make your soup taste like dishwater. Um, so uh, when we taste things, um, again, we don't accept freebies. We buy all our own products. We buy them from a variety of different stores. Um, it's presented without any packaging. They're around a big table um, with no talking, no funny faces. and. Uh, so it's presented like this. So this, I think, was gluten-free bread um, in an identical way. And uh, there's the tasting sheets down below. Now, a couple things here. So these are, this looks like about 10, 10 11 samples, uh, 10 samples. Not every taster starts with sample one because there is something called palate fatigue. And usually the last sample you taste is your least favorite. So you start at different positions around the table and you're told where to start. So you get an even tasting panel. The other thing is that two of these are the same. And you don't know this, it's double blind. So that 
if you're having a good tasting day, you'll rate it roughly the same every time you taste it. If you're having a bad tasting day, they'll be very different and your sheet gets thrown out because, yeah, you're not having a good, a good palate day. So uh, sometimes we actually have to blindfold ourselves. And they're tasting cheddar cheese to see if the same brand of cheddar, one's yellow, one's white, tastes different. Uh, how many of you like white cheddar? Yeah, how many of you like yellow cheddar? Yeah, so white cheddar is, is it, you think it's sharper in flavor and yellow cheddar is milder. Um, that's because traditionally cheddar is aged in caves and as the cheddar ages, it takes on that yellow hue. However, you know, a couple decades ago, they realized they could just add annatto powder to fresh cheddar to make it look aged. And so then it kind of tricked you into thinking that the yellow cheddar would be milder. But, and so the, whether the cheddars are the same or different, um, it changes from, varies from brand to brand and from year to year. Um, and we also do this with peanut butter, maple syrup, honey, because color has an impact on how you taste. Um, oh, we've done a lot of research, as I mentioned, so we don't have any advertising. So we're always asking people, what's on your radar? What are you thinking of? And so um, we just had our 20th season of ATK. <coughs> it's the longest running uh, cooking show on television. Uh, and you can see season one it was really um, different food than the food we're doing now. Uh, tomato sauce for pasta, beef stew, um, a holiday pie. Now we're doing Chinese favorites, Mediterranean, um, wholesome desserts, and, and some pretty fancy peri breast, and a trip to Rome. So very different style food is popular today than was 20 years ago. Um, cooking habits have changed, and this is really fascinating because this gets it to the core of what we do. Um, people are, about half, uh, half of you are cooking almost every day. Um, more than half of you cook for just two people, and most of our recipes serve four. Uh, we now have for two variations for every recipe on our website because we realized what, uh, what a help that would be for people. 14% um, cook just from themselves, and this number is actually going up. And that's not just people living by themselves. It's usually, even if you have two people and you're living together, you're on opposite schedules. And so you wind up just cooking dinner for yourself. In fact, we have a cooking for one book coming out, which is fun. Um, and how many uh, minutes you want to spend preparing a meal? About an hour seems to be the average. If you go much over an hour, it doesn't feel like it's good enough for a midweek dinner and making enough for leftovers. So we take this all into account when we're figuring out what recipes we're doing, how many people they should serve, how complicated they should be. Um, oh, this is interesting too. What you're looking for when you go to the supermarket. And most of these things are health oriented. So, and I think the health category is, is um, not only more important these days are on everyone's front of their mind more these days. Uh, if you look at all the top selling cookbooks, they're either from celebrities or they're health food books. Uh, so it is really what we're looking for, along with a lot of environmentally friendly ideas like locally grown, non-GMO. So that's interesting. Uh, and the biggest cooking challenges. Do you just not have time? Do you not have the energy? Are you needing motivation? Um, is it hard to time things together? So this is just, interesting things we've, we've um, researched over the past few years. Uh, here is some of our new books coming out. Um, we're going to talk everything chocolate today. Uh, instant Mediterranean. So Mediterranean, number one diet. It's been very popular for us. Instant Pot, also very popular. How many of you have Instant Pots? Yeah. How many of you want an Instant Pot? How many of you don't know what an Instant Pot is? <laughs> so an Instapot, for those of you who don't know or don't have one, is a combination slow cooker, crock pot, and a pressure cooker, an electric pressure cooker. So you get to decide whether you want to cook something slowly or quickly. Um, now, Instapot is a brand. It's a proprietary eponym at this point. Um, but the thing about the Instapot brand is that they're notoriously bad slow cookers. So everyone's just <laughs> using it as an instant pressure cooker, which is great. Uh, bowls, keto, keto is very popular and very successful. And then this, um, the complete cookbook for young chefs. We also have a baking book out, and we're about to come out with a do-it-yourself book. So homemade Nutella, lollipops, marshmallows, and some healthy things too. But um, this has been on the New York Times bestsellers list for about two years uh, since it came out. And so the 
that recipe development process I explained for ATK, what we did for kids is we brought kids into the test kitchen. We watched them cook, ages um, 8 to 12, to see how they could read a recipe and follow it. And we, and, um, we learned a few things. Um, steps have to be shorter. The serving sizes have to be much smaller. So you don't make two or three trays of cookie, you make one tray of cookies. You make mac and cheese for two people. Um, <laughs> we had to remind kids to wash their hands. We had to remind kids to turn the stove off when you're done cooking. <laughs> Learn that one the hard way. Um, and so it's fascinating. And um, so these books are doing really well. And uh, my daughter did a lot of the testing for these books. She's 11 now. And uh, what I really love is that I saw a change in her. Because she's she cooks with me all the time. She's my little sous chef, right? So when it came time for her to test a recipe, she was doing turkey burgers. And we went to the store. And she said, OK, I'm going to make these tomorrow. And she, come, she came home from school, and she was ready to make dinner. She's all in. And I said, well, it's a little, it's a little early. It's only 2.30. <laughs> so she prepped the burgers and put them in the fridge. And she said, when can I come back and cook? And I said, well, you know, around 5. 5 o'clock, she was there. I couldn't be in the kitchen. I had to sit on the counter stools on the other side and watch her cook. And she just did it. And then she called me and my husband for dinner. She said, Mom, what do you want on your burger? And she put the condiments on for both of us. I mean, that's all we had for dinner was just burgers. There was no sides. But she was so proud. And the next day, she took the dogs for a walk on her own. She's like, oh, I got this adult stuff. Like, I can cook dinner. I can take the dogs for a walk. And so to see that immediate change in confidence and ability to witness that in my own child, who knows cooking, uh, was just so um, endearing to me. And I just, so I'm very passionate about this project and excited to see it go forward. It uh, also has a great website. Um, these are the two magazines. Uh, Cooks Illustrated. All the recipes from America's Test Kitchen come from Cooks Illustrated. Cooks Country, same. All the recipes for Cooks Country TV come from Cooks Country. Uh, the recipe development is the same. The five recipe piece, the walking through the, the different aspects of um, what makes a recipe work. The presentation is different. So for Cooks Illustrated, it's the science of good food, why this recipe works and how. Cooks Country, I like to, see is the, I like to say, is the story of America told through food. What food is popular? Where? Who immigrated? When? And brought with them what ingredients and styles of cooking? And where did they land? So that Chicago has deep dish pizza, that there is this big Greek community in Alabama, that there are in Texas this town of Germans that make amazing pastries. And it's telling those stories and sharing those recipes. So those are the differences between the magazines. Um, proof, podcast, it's winning lots of awards. It's Bridget. Um, she goes into the weird food questions. Um, so I think their first episode, believe it or not, was on celery. <laughs> that was it. Um, yeah, she was really confident, you know? Um, but the thing about celery, I guess celery used to be a sign of wealth in the Victorian ages. And it was so expensive, you didn't eat it, you displayed it like flowers. People had vases specifically designed for celery. They were celery vases, and they had multiple colors. And over the years, somehow, it went from this really more expensive than saffron, more expensive than caviar, down to this, you know, one variety that, you know, has the singular flavor that people think of not as a main ingredient, but a little something you add when you're making soup or broth. So that's the first episode. Gearheads, which is funny, it's the behind the scenes of our equipment testing. And uh, What's Eating Dan, where he really tackles some science stuff. Um, and yep, our website. Now, if you wanted to be a recipe tester, you can go to our website, go down to the bottom, and I'll say about our magazines, and it's a little pull-down menu. And then it, you click that, and you can be a recipe tester. We'd well, love to have your input. So, all right, you've been looking at these chocolate samples long enough, very patiently. So I'm gonna run you through a quick um, tasting of chocolate. So I have here three samples of bittersweet chocolate chips, different brands. And so you're going to taste them, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hands for your favorites. You can also mark down uh, what you think about those chocolate chips on the, the, with the pencil and the little card that's in there. Um, now, when you're eating chocolate chips or when you're tasting, a um, couple things. Let the chocolate sit on your tongue. Let your body heat melt it and then taste it. And let it really let those flavors and the chocolate coat your mouth so you can really taste any nuances. And then if you have a sip of water in between, that's good too. 
Another neat thing we found about tasting, and this works with chocolate, is that what you listen to, the music you listen to, can affect your taste buds. And this comes out of some testing they did in Germany. It was Carl's Bad Beer um, that did the testing. They found if you had high-pitched even tones, either even tones or high-pitched and or, uh, things tasted sweeter. If you had low tones and they were um, a little off key, um, things tasted more bitter. So, and this mattered for beer. It was kind of the music they were going to play in beer halls or something. Uh, and so you can actually replicate that at home. There's uh, excerpts of the, of the songs they played online. And you can do your own taste test at home. It's pretty fascinating. I like wine. You finding some favorites? I like wine with your You like wine with your chocolate? I like wine with everything. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing they found is that the noise you're, you hear from your own chewing can affect how you taste things. And they did this test with Pringles. And they put headphones on people. And they played different noises while they're eating Pringles, like really crisp sounds. People thought, whoa, these are really crisp potato chips. And then really stale sounding crunches. And people thought what they were eating was stale. So that uh, what you hear when you eat really has a big effect. And the last thing to know about tasting is that you only really taste a couple things on your tongue. Sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami, which is that meaty flavor. Everything else, it, you, you're smelling. And you're smelling um, retronasally, which means as you breathe in and you eat something, those compounds go up the back of your throat into your nose. Um, and so that's where all the other flavors and nuances come from. I'll just keep talking about chocolate while you're tasting these. So these are bittersweet chocolate chips. And what's interesting is that there is no legal definition of the word bittersweet. So bittersweet and semi-sweet pretty much means the same things according to the FDA. Uh, the basic rule is it has to have at least 35% cacao for them to be considered bittersweet, semi-sweet. But that's pretty low if you look at some of the percentages you see on packages. Everything else is just what the brands want you to know. So one brand's bittersweet might actually be sweeter than another brand's semi-sweet. Uh, chocolate, the cho this bittersweet chocolate is really only made of three main ingredients. Uh, it is uh, sugar, of course, and then the cocoa butter and cocoa solids that come from the cocoa beans, sometimes vanilla. And of course these are chips, so sometimes chips have a, little, a few more emulsifiers. Chips and bars are not the same. Chips uh, often have a bit less cocoa butter that helps them retain that chip shape. So they don't melt as readily as bar chocolate. And a lot of people swap chips for bar chocolate and baking. Uh, we've done a lot of testing on this. It's fine if you're making something like a cake. The nuances and texture and flavor are not noticeable of most baked goods. If you're making a pudding or a custard, however, those changes in flavor and texture really show up. So you really should use bar chocolate if you're making a custard or a pudding. All right, how are we? We good? Yeah. All right, so how many people like sample A? Ooh, good number of you, okay. What's that? Got it? All right. Uh, how many of you like number, uh, number B, letter B? Okay, good amount of you, good amount of you. All right, last but not least, how many of you liked sample C? Aha, the majority, although a fair amount of you liked C. Well, um, for everyone who liked A and B, wrong. <laughs> You're not wrong. In fact, most of the chips we found uh, were totally recommended, and it's the flavor differences that are really personal. Um, our favorite was sample C. It is the our, um, it really weighted rated well in all of our testings. It is Ghirardelli baking, uh, which you know is sold everywhere. It's also not as expensive as um, it has 60% cacao in it, and that cacao again is a combination of cocoa butter and cocoa solids. Uh, it has a, and the higher the percent of the cocoa butter, the more it melts and the creamier it tastes. So uh, this is usually, the, this is what we use in the test kitchen when we develop recipes. I'll leave this up here if anyone wants to see it. All right, B, you like the good old Nestle Toll House. And for a lot of people, this is a chocolate chip, right? This is the original chocolate chip. Um, 
And so a lot of times when people like the original, it's more nostalgia than anything. Um, this often happens with ketchup. Uh, when we taste ketchup, there's, there's ketchup and then there's other things that pretend to be ketchup, right? There's Heinz and then there's everything else. And so chocolate chips are a lot like that. It's just nostalgia um, is, is, uh, plays a strong factor. And then um, sample A was Scharfenberger, which um, is a really <laughs> divisive brand. Some people love it, some people hate it uh, because it's very fruity, it's very complex. Um, and some people like those fruity, complex notes, and for other people, it's a bit much. Um, so that was Scharfenberger, and this is the most expensive one by far. Of course, you have expensive taste. Um, so uh, that's it. Thank you for coming out today. Uh, and thank you in particular to all the donors that helped make this possible.